The next item of business is statement by Graham Day on update on veteran strategy. And the Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Graham Day for 10 minutes, please, Minister. Presiding officer, uh, last November I informed uh, this Parliament of the launch of the strategy for our veterans. The strategy seeks to ensure that the whole of the UK is meeting its current and future commitments to veterans to 2028 and beyond. The Scottish Government engaged closely with the other governments of these islands during the drafting of the strategy, enabling it to be owned jointly by the respective administrations. An approach, of course, putting veterans' needs before any political difference and one in keeping with that taken here in this Parliament. The launch raised the profile of veterans' issues and provided an opportunity for the Scottish Government to highlight the priority we place on promoting veterans and their families as assets to our society and to providing effective support to those veterans who require it. One of my priorities since becoming Veterans Minister last year has been to seek to reinforce the positive narrative about veterans and to dispel myths around the scale of their needs. Whilst a small percentage will require additional and sometimes ongoing support when they leave the forces, the vast majority of service leavers transition to civilian life successfully, bringing their skills and attributes to bear, both in the jobs they go on to do and indeed enriching society more generally. Members subsequently debated the strategy and support for veterans in December, and I was struck by both the cross-party consensus and the constructive input from colleagues from all sides of the chamber. I'm grateful to members across this chamber for continuing this productive approach as we've taken the strategy forward. Today, I'd therefore like to update Parliament on the work that's been undertaken in Scotland since that launch. In parallel with the UK Government's public consultation on the strategy, which concluded in February, in Scotland we embarked on an extensive programme of face-to-face -face engagement with veteran stakeholders. Building on work already carried out by the Scottish Veterans Commissioner across some of the strategy's themes, this saw us talk directly to around 60 different veterans groups and organisations, taking in more than 450 people, a process which proved to be extremely valuable in understanding views in Scotland about how our veterans community is supported. I was keen to leave no stone unturned during the consultation and the breadth of our engagements ensured a wide range of opinions being heard, including charities, local authorities, health representatives, employers, universities and the Forces Families Federations. We also met with groups of veterans themselves from Kinloss and Lossiemouth in the north, down to Dumfries and Galloway and from Faz Lane through to the south. I was particularly pleased to be able to participate personally in many of the consultation events, allowing me to learn not just what was being said, but to get a genuine sense of the emotion and strength of feeling that lay behind some of the views being expressed. The range of views that were put to me directly, whether from various veterans champions across the country, charities large and small, groups of veterans when I attended their breakfast clubs, or some veterans in custody when I spoke to them when I visited HMP Guanoco, have proved invaluable in helping me understand what people think. And veterans are rarely backward in coming forward, which has been a good thing. President Officer, I believe that the consultation has been undertaken, this has been undertaken on the veterans strategy provides the most comprehensive feedback that's ever been gathered on support for veterans in Scotland, and this provides a firm footing on which to plan for the future. The UK Government is in the process of analysing the 4,500 responses that were received in response to the public consultation, including around 400 from Scotland, and they hope to have initial findings ready to share with us in the next few weeks. Allowing for the ana analysis to be completed, current plans are for the outcomes of the strategy to be announced jointly by the governments across the UK by the end of this calendar year. Meanwhile, we have been considering the feedback gathered during our own consultation, and I wanted to outline today some top headlines that we will be considering further with relevant stakeholders. We had a very constructive cross-party group last night, and I was reassured to hear that many of the points made uh, there chimed with the feedback that we had during the consultation. The consultation indicates a largely positive position in Scotland in terms of how we support our veterans community. Yes, there are areas where the need for improvements has been highlighted, but often this is a tailoring of approach rather than a radical rethink. Interestingly, a large amount of the feedback from the consultation was around the transition process through which service leavers are prepared for civilian life. Given the fundamental importance of a successful transition, if service personnel and their families are to adjust and thrive after life in the military, 
There were common views that the process needed to begin earlier, broaden the aspects of civilian life covered, and have more consistent support from the military chain of command. Although the transition process is reserved, the MOD are keen to hear what veterans in Scotland have been telling us. And this is something I will be discussing with the UK Government, including the Defence Secretary, when I attend the Ministerial Covenant and Veterans Board in Whitehall next month. The feedback has also indicated a desire to simplify and improve the information and guidance that is available for veterans. There's undoubtedly a lot of excellent support available, but the range of options can be daunting for some and we're exploring how we can make it easier for people to find the information they need. Many of the organisations we spoke to highlighted the need to prioritise better data on veterans in order to inform plans and expected demand. There was a universal welcoming of a question in the 2021 census that will identify those who have previously served. And although the final decision on this still remains for the Parliament, I'm grateful that colleagues across the Chamber have indicated their support for this proposal. And many of the other areas for improvement that have been identified are already being addressed in response to previous reports by our Scottish Veterans Commissioner, whose latest work I will touch on in a moment. I have to say that the positive picture suggested by the consultation reinforces the value of the decision made by my predecessor, Keith Brown, to establish a Veterans Commissioner in Scotland, a role that remains the only such position in the UK. It also reflects well on the more general work that Keith Brown did in that role. While we should rightly take some comfort in the initial findings of the consultation, and indeed I should thank the relevant ministers and officials across the various portfolios for getting us to this position, we now need to address the serious work of making improvements where we can to ensure that support for the veterans community remains effective for the next 10 years and beyond. This brings me to the report published yesterday by the Veterans Commissioner Charlie Wallace, who is with us in the gallery today. When the Commissioner and I first met last year, if we, after we'd both taken up our post, I was keen to discuss with him how the scrutiny of his role, the scrutiny function rather, of his role could be fulfilled. So I'm pleased to see such an in-depth analysis of where progress has been made since the previous Commissioner, Eric Fraser's 63 recommendations were published across his four reports on transition, housing, employability and skills, and health and wellbeing, and where we still have more to do. Charlie Walsh's report overall paints a positive picture of both the progress made and the attitude of this government to support, to, to, uh, towards supporting our veterans and their families. I know that as part of his work leading up to the publication of his report, Charlie had face-to-face -face meetings with a number of my ministerial colleagues, and I'm pleased that the report emphasises the cross-government commitment to the veterans community. In terms of the recommendations themselves, I do, however, recognise there are still a few to be implemented. Most of these sit within health, which was the subject of Eric Fraser's most recent report, and therefore it is understandable that these are less fully progressed. Of others, there is progress we can point to. For example, we've recently established an internal network for the armed forces community within the Scottish Government. One of the aims of this group is to provide increased support for ex-service personnel who work within the Scottish Government and, and others that are interested in the armed forces community. It will also help inform our approach to future recruitment, although it is, of course, the case that being a veteran is not a protected characteristic under the Equalities Act. We hope that this move begins to address the recommendation on jobs within the Scottish Government. But it's clear that we will need to continue to prioritise work to support veterans in the year ahead. Working closely with our stakeholders and partners, both to fully meet the challenges identified by the Veterans Commissioner and the consultation, and to take forward the findings from the Veterans Strategy. And I look forward to doing that. Presiding Officer. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in the statement, and I will allow up to 20 minutes for that. Uh, would members who wish to ask a question please press the request to speak buttons and I call Maurice Corey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement. Uh, the strategy for our veterans identified employment, education and skills, as well as making a home in civilian society among its key themes. These would, at least partly, be addressed by improving employment routes for veterans to go into emergency services and criminal justice roles. This is also relevant in the creation of the four science parks in Helensburgh, Lossiemouth, Rosyth, and Edinburgh. So can I ask what discussions the Scottish Government has had about these roles and what is the progress of development with the science parks? 
Uh, President officer, this, is this is obviously an issue that Maurice Corrie has uh, raised previously. The Scottish Government is prepared to explore any viable opportunities to improve post-service employment and the opportunities for military spouses to enter the workplace which, uh, where you can retain skills in the local area. Of course, such a, a proposal for an innovation hub located in proximity to Fires Lane or any other bases would require active buy-in from stakeholders, including the MOD, along with other local partners. Um, I am aware that the Hillsborough Community Council has been working with local veterans and other community groups uh, to develop a proposal for the creation of a co-working hub for use both by the civil and service communities and at Argyll and Butte are cited in this. Um, we would be, as I say, quite happy to engage with this, but we do need to see MOD buy into this and I would like to see some commitment there. Uh, with a view to uh, seeing how well we could progress this. Um, I also think it's important that, as well as looking to tap into the skill set of serving personnel in these locations, that we also look at the skills available from the spouses. I think that's something that we're currently missing at the moment. And as regard to the emergency services, I agree. I think that is certainly an opportunity. Oops. Mark Griffin. I'm grateful to the Minister for early sight of the statement and pleased to hear of the continued joint working to support veterans across the UK. Um, a, a week after the D-Day commemorations, I want to put on record our thanks to the Armed Forces personnel past, present and future for serving and protecting Scotland and the UK. Can uh, the Minister say how the Government is balancing that need to retain personnel in our Armed Forces, maintain uh, personnel numbers while creating a realistic and meaningful pathways into civilian employment for veterans and specifically how many veterans have been supported from referral to sustained employment by the Work First and Fair Start Employability Services. Graeme Day. Uh, can I firstly associate myself with the comments of Mark Griffin at the outset of his question. Uh, he also poses quite an important question, President Officer. Uh, I don't believe that addressing the retention issues faced by the Army in particular and improving the transition experience and pathways through rewarding employment somehow run contrary to one another. Indeed, I would argue that the latter can help address the former. It can be the case, for example, that serving personnel are leaving the military early because they might be dissatisfied and think the grass is greener on the civilian side. But some then discover that finding enjoyable, well-paying work is not as simple as they thought. If we, in partnership with the MOD, CTP and employers in the public and private sector, can improve the routes into employment that's financially rewarding and satisfying, we'll be able to better point to how the skills accrued during service do transfer into civilian opportunities and hopefully demonstrate the worth of remaining in the services for longer than is sometimes currently the case. And I should add that I'm finding a willingness on the part of the Army in Scotland to, to work with us on this. So I think it is a positive direction of travel there. With regard to the specific numbers that Mark Griffin uh, has asked for, I don't have those to my fingertips, but I will write to him. Move to the open questions, and again, brevity would be appreciated in questions and answers. Mike Rumbles, followed by Keith Brown. I know the Minister has visited some of our health boards in his role as Veterans Minister. Could I ask the Minister how he will ensure that there is an equitable level of service for our veterans of all ages throughout all our health board areas? He knows that I'm particularly keen to ensure that services in the Grampian NHS board area are up to the level experienced elsewhere. Graeme Day. President Officer, I completely agree with Mike Rumples in, in the point that he makes about equity of access to service. I think all our veterans across Scotland, regardless of where they live, should have equitable access uh, to the services they require. And that's a view very much shared by the Health Secretary and the driver for my having been undertaking a series of visits across the country. Since Mr Rumbles last uh, raised this matter, I've met those providing and accessing uh, Veterans First Point delivered services in Gala Shields and Irvine. I also visited Inverness to hear from NHS Highland and local veterans about how services are provided across the Highlands with the challenges that presents where they don't have V1P anymore. My officials have been seeking to arrange a meeting with NHS Grampian. There is one pending on, on the very same subject. Uh, I hope to have that take place during the summer recess, where I'll also be meeting veterans groups in Aberdeen. I hope this reassures the member that I have taken seriously, extremely seriously, his concerns around equity and ease of access, and I'm more than happy to engage further with him on that. 
Keith Brown, followed by Edward Mountain. Hey, does the Minister agree that the abject and repeated failure of the UK Government to even get close to targets for recruitment over a lengthy period now has a direct impact on veterans, including by uh, limiting the opportunities that service personnel have for training and taking on new roles, as well as the opportunity to choose when to leave the service uh, at a time of their choosing? Graham Day. Indeed, I, I do understand uh, and agree with the concerns that uh, are being expressed by Mr Brown. Uh, we were told that there would be an increase in numbers to 12,500 by 2020, and we are nowhere near seeing the, uh, that at the moment. All I can say to, to Mr Brown is this will be a matter that I'll be raising when I'm in London uh, at the beginning of next month. Edward Mountain, followed by Angela Constant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On the 4th of December last year, I raised the appalling shame, I believe, of the historic allegations inquiry. And the Minister agreed to take this matter to the UK Government. I would like to ask if he's done that, when he did it, and what was their response. And I realise this is not devolved. Graham Day. Uh, Presiding Officer, um, we tread warily in this issue well, uh, because there have been charges brought, so it would be inappropriate to comment on any current criminal investigation. However, uh, there has been a degree of dialogue with the UK government that has centred on their plans to hold a consultation relating to legal protections for armed forces personnel and veterans and officials are in touch with the Ministry of Defence on this issue. We await uh, the detail of the UK government's proposals and we will consider those fully as part of that consultation process that accompanies that. Angela Constance followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you, President Officer. I know the Minister is aware of the fabulous work uh, done by the Scottish War Blinded Centre at Lynburn in my constituency, and I really hope he can come and visit us sometime soon. Uh, meantime, can the Minister say what more can be done to signpost veterans with sight loss via the Certificate of Vision Impairment process uh, to services, uh, including the fabulous service offered by the Scottish War Blinded? Graham Day. Okay. Um, President Officer, the Scottish Government, with its partners, introduced the Certificate of Visual Impairment, CDI, uh, Scotland form in April 2018. We've had very constructive discussions with Scottish War Blinded and are now updating to uh, the accompanying uh, CVI guidance to expand the signposting for veterans to necessary services, including Scottish War Blinded. I had the pleasure of visiting Scottish War Blinded Centre in Hawkhead in May and was left uh, very impressed by the facilities. I also had the pleasure of speaking at their annual conference. And of course, I'd be delighted to visit the Elon Burn Centre. Jackie Bailey, followed by Stuart McMillan. Um, can I welcome the specialist mental health provision with funding provided to combat stress in veterans, first referred to in the report from the Veterans Commissioner. But I'm sure the Minister will agree that we need to also see an improvement in local mainstream adult mental health services where waiting lists are currently far too long. 20% of adults are waiting longer than the 18-week treatment time guarantee. Does the Minister believe that this is good enough? And if not, what changes will he make for veterans? Graham Day. Uh, officer, uh, in the context of veterans' mental health services, I think it's been made extremely clear by the government that the, the mental health strategy does cover specifically uh, veterans' issues. As Jackie Bailey has touched upon, we do already um, provide funding for combat stress and the needs of veterans within all mental health services. And I should add, there are issues sometimes around their children. Um, the, an issue was brought to me as recently as yesterday where youngsters in uh, service families will go on a CAMS waiting list, uh, but then the family move, as is so often the case, and they have to go on a CAMS waiting list somewhere else. Um, that's an issue I've undertaken with the Service Families Federation to look at in conjunction with the Mental Health Minister. So I hope that provides a reassurance that this is an issue in a holistic sense that we are very much cited on. Stuart McMillan, followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can the Minister inform me how has the Scottish Government ensured that veterans in receipt of social care in Scotland get the full value of their war pensions? Graham Day. Uh, Presiding Officer, I, I can confirm that the Scottish Government continues to provide £5 million of funding each year to local authorities to ensure that all veterans receiving social care at home or in a residential home will keep the 
full value of their war pensions and armed forces compensation scheme payments, as they will, will now be exempt from financial assessment. The, I think there's an estimated benefit of this for, I think it's 1,300 veterans in Scotland who now receive the full value of their war pensions, and I know that's very welcomed by those affected. Alison Johnson, followed by Annabel Ewing. Thank you. The Veterans Gateway report that finance is constantly in the top three areas of need upon leaving military life. Um, and the strategy points out that, that upon doing so, veterans can be uniquely unprepared for balancing the financial demands of civilian life. Now, the minister speaks of his desire to improve information and guidance available to veterans transitioning into civilian life. But what work is taking place to ensure that veterans have the guidance they need, appropriate advice and referral to financial advice, including education, where that's needed and appropriate? Graham D. Uh, uh, Alison Johnson is correct to highlight this area because it is one that's been identified. Um, I'd, I'd answer the, her question in two ways. In terms of access to, to education, where that's required. It, she means in a broader sense, and there's certainly a piece of work going on there just now. In a financial sense, I would maybe draw her attention to a pilot project that's been carried out quite recently, uh, an army base in Scotland. Uh, with Barclays Bank, who do wonderful work for our veterans in a variety of ways. And what they were doing was seeking to provide some sort of financial training for uh, a number of, of, of ser intended service weavers and others. And what emerged from that pilot was confirmation of the need for that. And we'd be happy to work with Barclays Bank to see if we can roll that out, because very often we recruit, particularly into the Army, young men and women from poorer backgrounds whose education at the point at which they've moved into the military has not been as extensive as we might all might want. And that includes issues around control of money and the ability to run a household budget. So I think there's a number of things we can do there. And again, I would commend the Army in Scotland for their willingness to engage in this sort of thing. Annabel Ewing, followed by Tom Mason. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Minister how the Scottish Government will build on the Welcome to Scotland Guide to ensure that service personnel and their families living or moving to Scotland can benefit, benefit from all that is an offer. And in that regard, does the Minister share my disappointment that the decline in the defence footprint in Scotland continues apace in breach of UK government promises? Graham Day. Well, as I said to Keith Brown, I do share that disappointment. With regard to the um, building upon the Welcome to Scotland guide, um, that guide is a very very good, positive um, publication that highlights exactly what is on offer in Scotland. But of course, uh, information is only as good as the ability to access it. And we have identified through the feedback and through some of the discussions we've had beyond that, an issue particularly around accessing the guide and that information for individuals and families who are actually living out with Scotland or based out with Scotland just now. And these may be individuals who are intending to return home or to choose to live here. So there is a piece of work going on with the MOD and with the Army in particular just now to see how we better get that guide and the information within it available to service families who are intending to settle here. Tom Mason, followed by Bruce Crawford. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Minister for his statement. The strategy for our veterans identifies 2028 as the target date for achievement of its key themes. Now, this will require work across government and organisations but is the Scottish Government confident in its ability to meet those targets in time? Additionally, the Minister referred to recruitment of veterans within the Scottish Government itself. However, Charlie Fraser's findings yesterday highlighted this as an area where more work is needed. Is the Minister able to set out how the Scottish Government plans to change that and lead by example? Graham Day. Uh, President Officer, 2028 is not a target as far as this Government is concerned. There are many things we could do relatively quickly to bring about immediate improvement, and that is what we would aim to do. So I have absolutely no doubt either about the willingness or the ability of this government to deliver on those things. But I should also say that these things are delivered in partnership. They're delivered in partnership with local authorities. They're delivered in partnership with the veterans charitable sector in Scotland. That's one of the strengths of this country. And they will have to be delivered in partnership with the MOD. So uh, I look forward to taking this, this uh, forward, as I say, and I do envisage being able to bring about meaningful change a lot sooner than 2028. 
Bruce Crawford, followed by Alex Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. In regard to ensuring the successful transition from a life in the military to Civvy Street, in particular in regard to the significant task of translating a thousand separate military qualifications into recognised civilian qualifications, can the Minister update the Chamber on the progress being made by the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework to ensure that qualifications obtained during a military career are recognised by civilian organisations? Graham Day. Um, President Officer, Bruce Crawford raises a matter that's been raised with me directly by serving personnel. Um, in response to one of the Commissioner's recommendations, work is currently underway with the Credit Qualifications Framework Partnership, funded by the Funding Council, to look at translating military qualifications into qualifications which can be quantified by civilian organisations. I think it's a really important piece of work, that, to assist our serving personnel into employment. Now, given the scale of the task, there's more than 1,250 separate qualifications to be considered. Initial work has focused on infantry qualifications, and a guide to infantry qualifications and what they mean in Scotland was launched in May. The SCQF will continue this work to consider other military qualifications, and I look forward to seeing significant progress in that regard. Alex Rowley, followed by Tom Arthur. President Officer, the Minister talked about the importance of partnership. I know that within most local authorities, they have a dedicated lead officer as well as a dedicated lead politician in terms of veterans and support for the armed forces. Can you tell me what kind of coordination actually takes place? Uh, I know that in Fife, the previous person, the politician, that was, that was dedicated and committed uh, to that role. Is there a coordination and joined up government between government as well as in government? Graeme Day. Uh, President Officer, um, I would cite Fife as a, a very good example of a local authority champion. Uh, Councillor Rod Cavanagh does a very good job there uh, in that role, but I have to say that's replicated across various parts of Scotland, across the political parties. Um, to answer Alec Rowley's point specifically, we haven't perhaps been as good as we ought to have been at pulling all that together and to sharing best, towards sharing best practice. So I can tell him that we are drawing up plans to have an event in the summer to which we will be inviting all the local authority champions. We will have the services there. We certainly will be inviting them to have a roundtable discussion about what it is that service personnel and veterans require and to share best practice across local authorities so we get a, a better equity of, of delivery of support. And the last question is to Tom Arthur. Thank you. Can the Minister outline what support is available to veterans to access safe and secure housing? Graeme Day. President Officer, housing um, and homelessness to a lesser extent are very um, important issues um, around uh, veterans, uh, in the context of veterans support. Um, we are doing some quite good work around identifying specific uh, housing allocations in various parts of the country. In a broader sense, since 2012, over four and a half million pounds of funding from the Scottish Government's affordable housing supply uh, programme has been awarded to organisations to provide new homes and adapt existing ones for veterans in Scotland. And during 2018, we revised and published a Scottish housing guide for people leaving the armed forces and ex-service personnel. And in February of this year, we issued revised practice guidance on social housing uh, allocations, and that includes a section on allocations uh, for people leaving the armed forces. But again, I would accept there is more that could be done in this area. That concludes questions on the ministerial statement, update on veterans' strategy, and we'll move on to the next item of business. <laughs>